let's look at local vaccine men with Keith present once again. All right, so if I look at this particular graph, X cubed, so I kind of know what a cubic looks like, all that good stuff, and I want to actually be able to find where the max and mins are. Remember the difference between a local max and min versus a global is local is tend to be within an interval because this function goes on forever, so that's certainly not the max of the function because it goes up there, right? And where the global then would be on the, the entire function. Okay, so we'll get to those where we typically talk about if we have a closed interval looking for max and mins. So to find a max and min using calculus, we find critical points. So what a critical point is, is where the first derivative equals zero or where the first derivative is undefined. And we don't really get into undefined. That gets into where you have cusp and, you know, things like that, jumps in functions. In this class, it will be where your first derivative equals zero. So that says something critically is happening there. It doesn't tell us if it's a max or a min. It just tells us it's a critical point. So if a function is continuous, so it has to be continuous, it's going to have a local max and min at a, at a particular p, then at that P, we call that the critical point. So critical points, critical points. Hopefully you're kind of noticing the critical point where the slope, where the derivative, hey, where the derivative equals zero. Okay, so that's what that last slide said. So I want to find all the critical points. So I guess I got to find the derivative, set it equal to zero and where the function is increasing and decreasing. So this was that first graph. We're going to just see if we can reproduce it. So first step, find the derivative. My phone's buzzing. So I find the derivative, bring the 3 down, 3x squared, bring the 2 down, 7 and 5 down. You're good at this, right? It's power rule. No problem. Set the derivative equal to 0 because the critical points are where the derivative equals 0. And then I have to solve this for x. And oh gosh, I got to go back to algebra again. What I did is I noticed every term had a factor of 3. So I factored that out to make this easier to factor. And so then I do my factorization. Oh gosh, do you remember that? x, x, x squared, uh, 2x minus 8. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 8 times 2. Got, got it. If you can't factor this, and of course this being a quadratic, you can always use the quadratic formula. Ooh, that means scary. All right, it's, it's okay. Calm down. And so then remember that you set your factors equal to zero. We don't have to worry about the three because it's just a constant. It doesn't have a variable on it. So we set x minus eight equal to zero, which means x equals eight. x plus two equal to zero, which means x equals negative two. And that would be our two critical points. A critical point is where the first derivative equals zero. Well, there you go. Don't know what's happening there, but it's something critical apparently. So what, what you typically do is you draw a number line and you put your critical points on it. So negative, where, where those numbers come from? Negative two and eight. So negative two and eight. And then you pick values between, so any numbers in here, you tend to pick them to be close, but any numbers you pick in here, and then you plug them into the derivative. Think about it. If I plug in a number to the derivative and I get a positive, that tells me it's increasing. If I get a negative, that says it's decreasing because the derivative slope, hey, there you go. All right. So I plug in negative three. Where'd I get negative three? My head, because negative three is in this interval. So I just pick some number. I plug in negative three and I see I got a positive number. So that says that function is increasing in this interval. It hits a critical point where the function, the derivative equals zero. Then I pick something in this interval. Man, I always pick zero when you can because zeros are nice, aren't they? Except when they're your grades. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that wasn't funny, Cindy. So I picked a zero because that's in this interval. I plug it in and I get a negative. So this, so it looks like the function's going up. It hits zero and then it's coming down. 
I pull again something into this last interval. I plug in nine, hey, because that's bigger than eight, and I get a positive value. So I kind of just draw this with arrows and I can see it's increasing the derivative equals zero. So flat slope, horizontal slope. It decreases critical point. So that's where my derivative equal to zero. And then it starts to increase. So I can see now here within this interval, I have a local max and I have a local min. So basically what this is saying is if your function is increasing, goes to zero, decreases, that's going to be a max. If it's decreasing, goes to zero, increases, that's going to be a min. And as you saw, we this is what our function looked like. Now you need to remember that at those critical points, that negative two and eight, you also need to find the y values. So how do you do that? You go back to the original function and you plug in those critical points because those are x values and then that would give you the y values. So when I ask you for a critical point, I'm asking you for the x, y, right? Okay, because that's the actual point. And as you're going to see, a lot of times you're going to interpret with that y value. All right, so this is kind of what I just said that if the first derivative is negative, and then we hit our derivative of zero, and then it goes positive, then I know that would be a min. If it goes positive, zero, negative, then that would be a max. And this is what we call the first derivative test for local max and min. Okay, so again, the big key is when you set the derivative equal to zero, that says you have a critical point. Don't know if it's a max or a min unless you go through this test and actually see. All right, um, there is actually another way to do this, and I find it a little bit easier if the second derivative is, is easy to find. So if I find the second derivative, I can tell you if it's a max or a min. So let's, let's see what the, what's going on here. Uh, concave up, concave down, hmm, let's see. So let's find the second derivative of this function. So 6, 18, that goes away. Now what I do is I plug the critical points into the second derivatives. Okay, so I, there's my negative 2 and 8. I took the second derivative. I plug in the critical points into my second derivative. If I get a negative, it's sad, it's a frown face, it's a max. If I get a positive, it's happy, it's a min. All right? So this is just... In, instead of figuring out that increasing zero, decreasing if it's a max, decreasing zero, increasing if it's a min, this is just a quicker way if your second derivative is pretty fast. Find the second derivative, plug in your critical point, so it'll tell you at that second derivative, do you have a max negative or do you have a min? And that's what this chart is saying here. Um, second derivative, positive, concave up. Uh, negative concave down so that's what we're seeing and then remember if we get zero it's straight no concavity and the straight no concavity you got to be very very careful not every critical point of a function is a local max or min so notice here this function increases it hits zero but then it goes back increasing remember we said that the definition that first derivative test increasing zero decreases Okay, and so this is a critical point here, but it's not a local max or min. And you got to be aware of that just because the first derivative equals zero does not mean it's a max or a min. You either have to do that first or second derivative test. All right, now the point for those of you that friended me on Facebook, not going to like me much anymore. So suppose Camilla and Rebecca are applying for the same job. Hey, aren't they so cute? Camilla! wants the job so badly she stabs st why would you do that Rebecca with a needle and administers a particular drug in Rebecca's drug bloodstream so she will that Camilla that's just rude that is wrong and rude Dr. Mia oh, how, how, how you doing Dr. Mia this is nice, that's my fine doctor right there performs an experiment to find the percent of concentration of drug in the blood bloodstream so Rebecca will know when the percent is beginning to decrease so she can be ready for this drug test. Miss Dr. Mia looking sharp right there. 
finds that t hours later, okay, so t is in hours, the percent of concentration of drug in the bloodstream can be modeled by this function. So this function will tell me the percent of the drug that's in the bloodstream. Brianna tells Rebecca, don't, don't sweat my pet. Don't worry, do that. Hey, got it going on, right? After one hour, the concentration of the drug in your bloodstream will start to decrease. Just take a nap like you did in Sydney's pre-cal class, right? Yeah, hey. And you'll be just fine. Is Brianna correct that the concentration of drug in the bloodstream will basically top out at one hour and then start to decrease? Hmm. Fish lips. <laughs> what do you do? So they're basically saying that it's going to, the drug's going in her bloodstream, it's topping out, and then it starts to decrease. That's what we want to figure out. So I guess we probably want to find a critical point. How do you take the derivative of this quotient, quotient rule? Yeah, so there's my quotient rule. Quotient rule says take the derivative of the top, leave the bottom alone, minus leave the top alone, derivative of the bottom, and then square the bottom. All right, you better pause that video and you better do that. Can you do that? All right, now from here, I just kind of make things look a little better. I multiply all this stuff out, um, collect like terms. Now notice when we set the derivative equal to zero, if I multiply both sides by the denominator, the denominator just goes away. And that's kind of weird for most students. If you don't like that, write times t squared plus one squared times t, oh yeah, multiply by zero, so it cancels on this side and that becomes zero. So all we really care about is when does the, the, the numerator equal zero. And so I solve this, I move the 5t squared to the other side, I divided both sides by five, I square root. When you square root, remember technically you should be doing plus and minus, please don't forget that. When you square root, this should be plus or minus one. Why is it positive one only? Because this is time, okay? So whenever, you know, you have to think about the problem, mathematically it's plus or minus one, but with this problem, it's just t equals one time. And so as we can see, if we graphed it, um, that Brianna was actually correct, that it will top out right here at one, and then it starts to decrease. And that's it. And I, I apologize for those students that I went and stalked you and got your pictures off Facebook. No, I'm not, I'm not sorry. <laughs>